Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. You just be sitting up there jacked with Pepsi. <laughs> I'm there for the pot goat. You just got to pack me in. Committed to the bow early on. Like, I love getting close and putting up. You cover a range of stuff on here, too, right? Like, we call this the, uh, the THP World Headquarters. You know, my grandpa Roy Weatherby. I came into, like, that golden little pocket where there was, like, four or five different bowls. Just... You're Canadian? We're doing yeah, a Canadian I... podcast? My name's Douglas Bowes. I'm Robbie Denning. Roy Candy. Sounds, sounds good. No problem. Cool. Cool. So yeah, we'll just dive right into it then. And uh, um, yeah, Pete, if you have any questions, fire away. Um, yeah, absolutely. So maybe right off the get go, Doug, you could just talk about, so like it's early spring right here. Like we've got a lot of snow and obviously like we've talked about it before and like the kind of, you know, the, the typical conversation is I think everybody by now knows, like you're going to want to hit those South facing slopes. You're going to be looking for areas that greened up quick. Like that's a general idea of where the best place to look look to find bears but getting into that a little more like um what what should people be doing to like they find areas like that right away what should they be looking for like getting into an area say a south facing slope there's no bears there immediately but there are signs of bears like what's the best time of day to get go into that into that area and start calling and kind of like what you do specifically when you get into an area like are you setting up up top of the mountain looking down you're setting below looking up are you worried about the thermals you know that kind of thing and uh and then maybe just like what your cadence like what your sequence of calling is okay so that's a long question yeah Um, that is that's super long and it's uh it's detailed or really throwing it at you this time eh? i should have been writing all that down yeah (laughs) so in the beginning like genesis and uh the good book of the bible uh so let's 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 just kind of start at the beginning. So, yeah, I I don't like to waste time calling when it's really windy or or if it's like raining outside. And I I have found like decent weather in the springtime seems to be an attractant for bear. Oh, they're they're more active, right? So especially after some crappy storm or something blows through, and then you get a break in the weather, um, a little bit of sunshine, kind of those clear days. It's, it to me, it seems that bear are more active during that time, whereas in the rain and wind, they kind of bed down. I don't know why, but that's just my personal experience. So rainy, crappy days, I'll try to avoid. Now, if it's, you know, if I'm out hunting and it's nice out and it turns to a rainy, crappy day, that's not going to stop me. But I try to plan my hunts around that. So that's kind of step one for me. Um, as far as my setup goes, I definitely pay attention to thermals and that's going to dictate if I'm calling uphill or downhill. So, you know, in the morning when it's still cold out and the thermals are kind of pushing downhill, I might be called uphill into a cut. Um, And, you know, one thing I haven't said in recent podcasts that I've noticed is, and I kind of forget to say it, but you want to make it easy for the animal to get to you. Um, So that's kind of important um, that the easier they can get to you, the more likely they'll come to you and you can get a shot. So try to position yourself to make it easy for the animal to come to you. So in the mornings, I would probably call uphill if the thermals are blowing downhill. And in the afternoons and evenings or late mornings, when the thermals are kicking up, I would probably call downhill. So you want to, you want to definitely play the wind um, thermals, especially when you're predator calling. Um, And I've stated this before, like, I I like to call when it's calm out with little to no wind as best as possible because the sound carries further. Um, Your, your smell isn't getting pushed as hard, but if there is a wind, uh, I either want it kind of directly in my shooting lane or to my left and right, but I want to 
I want to pay attention to that because predators like to certain predators, um, coyotes and bears, they like to kind of circle you to get your scent. And to do that, they're going to go downwind where your scent is blowing. So if, if you're calling into the wind and your scent is blowing in your, or excuse me, the wind is blowing in your face and it's going behind you, they might circle around behind you, catch your scent and then bone out. Mm -hmm. If, if it's going at your back and then down the shooting lane, kind of in front of you, they might circle around your left or right and get into that shooting lane to smell you. Um, and it, that might give you a shot. It sounds kind of counterintuitive, but that's, that's the way I set up. And I got that idea from a very good, one of the best, in my opinion, coyote callers, Randy Anderson from Primo's Calling All Coyotes. That's what he recommended too. And when I first started hunting, that was something that stuck with me and it's, it's paid off for me personally. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I like to call, let's see, when, I, when I'm setting up, um, safety is important, especially if you're calling by yourself and depending on if you're in grizzly country or whatever else, um, I like to have something to my back, like a solid tree or a stump. Um, worst case scenario, I'll, ha I'll have a big pile of brush or something behind me. So the hope is, is that I would actually hear something coming in before it tackled me. Um, but yeah, I like to have something to my back or if I can get up high. So if I can get up on top of a stump or a, or a slash burn pile, um, that's always good too. Even, even a couple of feet off the ground, especially in brushy areas that can give you a nice view uh, of the surrounding area that you wouldn't necessarily have at ground level. Mm -hmm. So getting up high is always, always a good thing. Yeah. So uh, like Doug, um, are you, are you looking into like, for like, are you look, focusing on like clear cuts, like in these areas? What, what specifically are you looking? Are you just looking for like grassy, like grassy mountain sides or you, or are you, or more clear cut type of areas or is it like thick bush or I guess, is there, is it all just depend on, on weather, where you are, and and that kind of thing. Yeah, it all kind of depends on like just the the time of year and stuff like that. But let's say springtime, okay? Yeah. Uh, I like to cover a lot of ground in the springtime. So when we had a spring bear hunt in Washington, if you got drawn, I I would like drive main logging roads, and I would look for decommissioned or grown up logging roads. And so I would park. And then I would walk down those roads and for, you know, a couple hundred yards and see mm -hmm. if I started to find bear sign. If I didn't find any bear sign, I'd go back and then I'd go find another road and I'd cover a lot of ground that way. But once I started to find bear sign, um, that's where I would set up. And, that, and so this time of year, you know, they're, they're in brushy spots, but they're, they're starting to, they're starting to peel those trees. Like I've talked about before. Yeah. And so you want to kind of find those, those cuts that aren't super old, but they're not super young. You, I, I rarely pay attention to like real fresh cuts, like a cut from last year or the year before. Um, I, I pay attention to them a little bit in the spring. I'll kind of look at them, but you know, usually a bear would stick out like a sore thumb. If you have a decent view of that cut, you'd be able to see it pretty quick. So I, I don't pay a ton of attention to those. The, the, the cuts I pay attention to are probably five to eight years old, maybe a little older. They got those trees, you know, yay big around. Yeah. Those are what I like. Um, and those are kind of what I call into, but so it depends now too. Like sometimes you'll find those areas and you just don't have a shooting lane. So what do you do? Well, if, if that's the case, I'll try to get up high, like I say, or I'll, or I'll try to call them out into the road. So like, if it's an old logging cut, I'll go almost to say the road dead ends. And so that way I kind of know, Hey, there's nobody else walking, obviously right on this road. I'm, I can see the end of the road. I'm only 150 yards from it or something to that effect. Um, and I will call down into that with the hopes of drawing those things out, at least to the edge of the road where they feel safe, but they're still in cover, but they, they pop out enough for you to get a shot. Um, it's, it's, it's very subjective, um, about where mm -hmm. I set up. So if you're going into an area and you find lots of bear sign, you got shit, you got rubs, you've got scrapes, everything you like, all the things you like, all the ingredients you like, but you have no shooting lane. What would you do then? Um, I, I would look for, would you just way, force, try to create, try to create one? It, yeah. I mean, I, I would look for an area that I could kind of get up high, um, or I would travel down a little bit 
one way or the other to try to create an open lane or, right. um, you know, just find, find a shooting lane. Now in, in 2009, when I shot that spring bear, when I, when I first started to hunt that area, it was so thick, I couldn't see nothing. Um, and so the next day out, this is kind of before Onyx and stuff like that, yeah. but I went on Google earth and I was able to look at it satellite wise. And I could see little dots of like parkland areas, little patches of, of green grass of 50 to a hundred yards. And so I figured I was figuring that I would just walk into one of those patches and hopefully find a bear there. Um, and so I stumbled upon that bear actually, but those would be good places for me to call too. So, you know, there's, if you can find small areas like that, that are 50 to hundred yards, 200 yards big that are surrounded by brush and stuff um, that are kind of secluded. Those are, those are nice. Those are money spots. Right. Right. Yeah. So you don't like, you're not going to leave if, it, if it's got all the ingredients you, you want, but it's such a shoot lane, you're just going to keep looking, trying to create something, just trying to, I mean, it's yeah. Like don't go, don't leave an area that, you know, has bears go looking for other bears just because there's no shooting lane. Yeah, don't leave bears to go find bears. And yeah. in, in, in all honesty, if I find a road or, or an area that has like a bunch of peels and, and fresh sign and stuff like that, I won't bother calling. I will just kind of stop and listen oh, yeah. and walk very, very slow uh -huh. with the hopes of finding them working those edges of the roads or hearing them peel. Okay, I mean, I've even last year, I was 20 yards to bears that were just going to town along these roads. And you can sneak right up on them if they're comfortable and they're eating. Um, they're loud. You know, they're not trying to be quiet. You can sneak right up on, on bears and, and yeah. get shots. So, yeah, I, I lots of times I won't call. You know, if I'm finding right. sign, stop and listen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, sometimes I've called too, and I've actually scared bears away for calling. Just, But, I mean, I'm a shitty caller, so. Well, no, I'm, and, and that does happen. You know, some yeah. bears some bears take off and some bears come running yeah. right at you. It's just, they're goofy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, dun, dun, dun. You know, um, what about, so mornings versus evenings, obviously, you know, the golden rule is a little later in the day is, is best. What, like, going back to those areas like clear cuts open grassy meadows same sort of thing like is there a specific is there a specific area you find that's that's historically turned up more bears compared to others like is it the logging roads is it those clear cut those older clear cuts or maybe the meadows i, I like decommissioned logging roads mm -hmm. in the springtime for sure that yeah. it's you can walk quietly you can cover a lot of ground you can find um, bear, you know, bear peels because those trees are easy to find. Um, you can find bear sign. Th those, for me personally, are my money spots. Right, um, right. Not logging roads that are, you know, driven all the time or hiked all the time. You want to head off to the crappy ones, um, and, and you can weasel your way kind of through the brush. Some of them are. There, there's one that I hunt that's almost too overgrown now. In fact, probably this year I won't be able to hunt it just because it's now it's so thick. I, I'd have to be stepping on the thing to even find a bear. But I like kind of a thicker logging road. You know, alders kind of sprouted up through it, um, or at least you know grass that's that that's growing in nice from the the extra sun that it's getting. Right. Okay. So um, and, yeah, it does. It doesn't make a difference though. Like morning. Like if if if, if people are hunting in the morning, they're not necessarily looking for different areas then the evening it's kind of like if there's bears in the area the morning's good evening's good uh it, you know it doesn't make any difference yeah and and in the spring particularly i think that uh bears seem to be kind of more active almost all day yeah uh, and and you know as as it gets hotter as the yeah. year goes on in the in the summer and stuff they start to bed down because it's too freaking hot with a black jacket on like they have right and so yeah. they they, they hunker down until the late afternoon and then they start going to work again in yeah. the spring on those nicer days they seem to be you know they're active in the morning but they seem to be just kind of active all day um yeah. they're, they're hungry it's cool out so you know why not they're working to get those calories yeah and i find too that if it starts getting close to the rut like and around the rut not necessarily through the rut but just as it gets closer i, I seem to find the, the more bears out just cruising around 
more often in the middle of the day than you do and, a little little later on or definitely in the fall anyway yeah for sure and you know think about it if if you could only mate once a year you'd be out cruising too yeah you're not going to waste any time no nope. around sleeping in or else somebody's <laughs> going to be doing your dirty work for you <laughs> so to speak <laughs> <laughs> So what about calling? Like, you know, we, we've talked before about calling and, and uh, you know, what kind of calls you like to use. And um, so maybe you can just walk us through, like you get into an area and you set up and you find a good spot. And now you are going to do some calling and, you, you know, how, how long till you get into that spot before you start calling? How long are you calling for? And then when you stop calling, how long are you waiting for? before you leave that area or like how, how, and also how long are you giving the area a chance to produce any bears or any activity before you decide, okay, this is no good. I'm going to move on to the next one. So it, it, okay. So I'll go into an area and, um, you know, if, if I'm able to drive, so a lot of the logging roads locally, they're gated like right at the get go. So you got to hike in X amount, but say they're not and yeah. say I'll park along a, a, a spur, and I'll walk that log and road. I'll walk, you know, a couple hundred yards or however far it is until I kind of find an area that suits me. So like uh, maybe crawl, crawling down into a creek bottom or maybe there's a, a, a brushy cut kind of up above me. Um, but I'll walk, you know, quarter mile, half mile from the truck. Um, my, my favorite spot, I'm walking a mile, a mile and a half in. Um and what I'll do is I'll, I'll find a spot to sit down. So I'll find a stump or whatever it is. And I'll, I, I won't, um, highlight myself or skyline, excuse me. Yeah. So, you know, when you're sitting on a stump, you don't necessarily want to sit on top of it. You want to kind of sit on it. So mm -hmm. it breaks up your, your human outline. Yeah. yeah you want a backdrop. Yeah. And you, you kind of tuck yourself in there. And, and what I'll do is I'll sit there for five Five minutes usually. I say five to ten, but usually for me it's like five minutes. Now, it, when you walk into a spot, you'll notice that birds and everything else they shut up because you're creating a noise and you're you're not what they're used to. Mm -hmm. But if you sit down and you just wait, those things start to kick back in. You know, nature kind of just starts taking over. The birds will start chirping, blah blah blah. And so I'll wait, and while I'm sitting there waiting for that return, I'll be looking for points in front of me. To kind of memorize so hey that stump looks like this there's nothing on that rock this bush looks like that you know you, you try to memorize what's in front of you because sometimes bobcats um bears stuff like that they'll they'll just poke a head around or they might even i've had bobcats jump on top of stumps and just sit there and look at you right um, i've had bear hop on top of stumps and just look at you um so it's good to kind of memorize the stuff around you mm -hmm. as far as how long am i calling I like to call for at least an hour. Um, well, not at least. I call for an hour, and then I'll wait another 15 to 20 minutes after I've stopped calling to see if something comes in. Mm -hmm. I've broken this rule a couple of times because for me, after I've been sitting there for an hour, I'm kind of anxious to get up, stretch my legs, you know, like. But oh, yeah. I've, I've broke that rule, and I've lost bears that way because I've stood up and, and uh, started walking out, and the bear's coming in, and because I left the – the, the the stand early i might have uh, had a shot if i would have sat there um the, the cougar is a very similar situation to that but we can get into that later um so i'll call for an hour wait 20 minutes um the, the cadence i like to start off kind of quiet i want to see kind of what's close by i don't want to just go full blown you know three quarters to 100 percent of my lung capacity or volume of the electronic caller I want to see if, if something is close by to bring it in, you know, it might only be a hundred, hundred yards away from me. And if I'm just launching on something that might just freak it out and it takes off running. But if I'm, you know, calling kind of sweet and quiet, it might right. come in to kind of check it out. Then as time progresses, so kind of at the 20 minute mark is how I do it in my head, 20, 40, 60, or maybe even like 50. So at the 20 minute mark, I'll bring it up a little bit more at the 40 minute mark, a little louder. And then at the 50 minute mark, you know, three quarters, almost all the way. And then right near the end, I'll either peter off real slow or I'll just die altogether and then just wait. Right. As far as the types of calls, um, man, there's, you know, there's all sorts. Now, 
I've, I've heard people like, oh, I'm not going to use the fond distress um, in in early April because uh, the fonts haven't dropped yet or something to that effect. And it's like, hey, bears don't have a calendar. You know, yeah. they're not they don't know that fonts drop at April 20th and not on the 16th or the 10th. <laughs> the whole idea is to create that predator response to to get that attack mode of that bear or that predator to come into you. And that can be very simply a fawn distress or a calf distress um, or something unique. So, you know, if you're hunting an area that is heavily hunted and everybody and their mother is blowing on a rabbit distress, very similar to like elk hunting when hoochie mamas were popular. If I blow a hoochie mama now where I go elk hunting, the elk are like blowing out because they know it's a human. Yeah. So if everyone's blowing on a rabbit distress, pick something else. Pick a wild boar call, maybe a coon squall, pup distress something different to get that animal to come in yeah for sure yeah they're fi- go ahead pete i was gonna say do you find that d- does your timing change at all depending on the time of season like maybe when the fawns and calves are actually dropping and you know the bears are it's not like their first one they've already you know they've already caught a couple of them and you know it's like it's game on time do you find your timing you you, you have to call less like you, you'll be able to move from spot to spot a little quicker because they're going to come in quicker and it's like, there's no bears here. Or does your timing stay the same irregardless the time of, you know, whether it's April, May or June, does, does it change at all your timing? My timing stays the same until it doesn't have to. So what I mean by that is like, I always give it an hour because I've noticed that bear will generally only move while you're calling. Um, so when you're blowing on that thing, they're walking or running or whatever. When you stop, they stop. And so you have to figure if the bear is 500 yards away and hearing this, how long is it going to take him as a, at a walk through all that junkie he has to go through to get to me? It might take him that full hour. Um, but there are times when I've called bear in within five minutes uh, and, and the bear was surrounded by blackberries and everything else that were ripe. Um and, you know, obviously I stopped then, but it, it's for me, I just kind of stick to that. I stick to the one hour and then the 15 or 20 minutes sit afterwards. And that's, that's worked out best for me. Right. I haven't noticed, I haven't noticed an increased uh, response time as the year has progressed. Yeah. So throughout the months, April, May, and June, and we'll, we'll stick to those because we're talking about spring bear hunting. Yeah. Um, the, your key, the the call sequence it doesn't change at all it's it just you you kind of have a template of what you do and you stick to it and it's worked in all three of those months yeah yeah it has that's good cool i tried that uh that fond distress i think i showed you a picture of it i got i found last year it worked really well really hmm. well yeah um Who made and, that but it call? was a new Which one which one were you talking about there? I remember you showed me something. I can't remember which one it was. Oh, though. I don't remember the name of it. It's probably sitting beside me in that cupboard there, but it's a, just, it says right on it. It's a black, it says fond distress. I'll find it. I'll put it in the show notes, but it's a black. It says actually fond distress. It works really well. Um, and now I like what you were talking about earlier, Doug was um, the area gets used to calls. And like, I always hunt the same area, pretty much the same area for bears, just because I always seem to be chasing one specific or, you know, two specific bears. And I go into an area and I kind of call, and this is what kind of maybe, maybe to add to what you said, maybe this is what happened was I was always using the same distress call. I've used it for years in that area. And now I'm adding a different sound to an area completely different. I know nobody else hunts bears in this area, just me. So maybe that, you know, right away I had a lot of success. I was calling a lot of bears and I called one bear. He almost sat in my lap, um, you know, and, and, but that maybe that's one thing to new. And that maybe for the listeners, that's a good tool too, is have more than one call in your bag. Don't just have, you know, have, don't just have one card trick, have a bunch, right? Like try a call and then try a different call and then, you know, try a different call to mix it up a bit. So you're not always using the same call. Yeah. And, and but don't do that on the same set. So for example, if you're yeah, doing yeah, like not the same set. <laughs> yeah. If you're doing the calf distress, don't switch to like rabbit <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, you can you can add that scenario. So um, like with calf distress, sometimes I'll add a a, a coyote howl or, okay. a, or a pup distress. So, yeah. you know, does that kind of make sense? Oh yeah, Where, definitely. Yeah. And we had a question for you about that too. Is that do you ever use coyote calls 
when you're when you're um, bear hunting. Like all of a sudden you're blowing on a distress call and then let out like a coyote howl at the same time and you're in, in your same set. And has he had any success with that? See, I know that guy never read my book because I talk about it in my book. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I have used a pup distress and um, I, I remember I was doing, I, I was up on a power line cut I was calling down below me. I had a stump to my back and like the, it was September time and I was predator calling, predator calling with a rabbit distress. Nothing was happening. And I hit a pup distress and I looked over and man, this bear was just hauling ass up the road right at me. And he was only like 50 yards. And I just kind of swung my rifle and he went right behind the stump to my right. And then, um, that was it. He, he disappeared into the brush to the right of the stump and then into a tree line. But yeah, that pup distress, uh, really kicked it up a notch for him. He just come flying in for that. Right. He didn't want anybody stealing his meal to yeah. that guy's defense for buying your book though, Doug. I don't think there's any of those books left on Amazon Canada. Is there? No. Yeah. I, I actually saw that. I think, I think Canada sold out, but you can yeah, buddy. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. We, That's wicked. Yeah. yeah. Right on. Yeah. And That's there's great. only th- one left in uh, America, Amazon. Yeah, too, right on, dude. Good for you. That's awesome. Yeah. It's good to see. Well, so what print was this again? I, we'll get back into the, but it, I, I want to talk about this for a sec because it's quite an accomplishment. It's awesome. Oh, thanks. Uh, I think it's the fourth reprinting. Wow. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. I know I've passed my book on just to a couple buddies that I, you know, they, they don't bear hunt a ton, mm-hmm. but it's like, no, you need to read this. Like this yeah. here's got some cool info. And I always uh-huh. make sure I get it back because I like to reference it too. Yeah, I make it's, sure it's I, great. I, I. Yeah, it is. And I've told I've I've told other people about the book. They're like, "Oh, can I borrow yeah. yours?" I'm like, "Go fuck yourself. You're not getting mine. You go buy a book." See yeah. now that there's my guy right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, pass it around if you want to. It always helps when somebody buys it. But yeah, it's and you know, if I was that concerned about really selling books, I would never do podcasts because a lot of what I talk about, I talk about in the books. But I, I just want be a short to- podcast. Well, go buy my book. Here's the link. Okay, thanks yeah. for really coming on. <laughs> thanks for showing up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, you do cover that in your book, and but that's it, it's good to know that kind of stuff too, because I mean, like for myself, I've never, I've never tried that out, but it's definitely something that um, it doesn't hurt to try. And I mean, worst case scenario, it just it, it doesn't work and but just because it doesn't work that day doesn't mean it doesn't work at all i mean there's the bears are so funny like um you kind of touched on too like if you can weather the storm I, I found you know um if you if it's say it's in the morning it's pissing rain it's windy it's really crappy if you can just sit through that crappy shitty weather all of a sudden the sun comes out the, cl- the clouds break all of a sudden you're seeing bears everywhere i find like it's just like okay time to get out and feed and um, calls work great then and like everything works great then working those logging roads all that stuff spring bear kind of reminds me a lot like blacktail hunting because like i always say the crappier weather the better the blacktail hunting and, but especially like right after a storm when that when it quits raining and mm-hmm. it kind of lightens up there's like blacktails just popping out yeah. everywhere yeah um and and to go back to your previous point I usually have like two, I have like a call in my pack and probably another one stuffed somewhere because sometimes the reeds will break or, or they get, you know, frozen up, whatever. Um, and, and I will do that. I'll, I'll, I'll do a calf distress one set and then say, I'm, I'm going to hike a quarter mile or a half mile down the road. I'll do a rabbit distress the next set. So I do like mm-hmm. to mix it up because, you know, it's a lot like bass fishing. Like I talk about in the book, you just, you don't know what lure is going to work. So just yeah. keep casting out. Yeah. And you got to find the right lure for the right fish. Yeah. So, okay. So say you're going out on an evening hunt, right? You just finished work. You're off work at four o'clock. You're going to drive some logging roads. You find a, a spot. It's a good sign. You walk down, see a good spot. Thermals are good. You start calling. Um, nothing shows up after an hour. Now you're going to, how far do you usually go before you're going to, before you're going to start that sequence again? Like, how, like how spread out are you, are you traveling in between your sets? It depends on the on the wind and the terrain, um, but usually, you know, I'm I'm probably going at least a quarter mile, right? Um, probably a little farther because you know your sound, depending on what it is, it's probably only going to go three, four, five hundred yards. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, so you want to get out of that range and then a little bit further and then set up again. So, I'll, I'll you know I'll I'll go probably at least a thousand yards, something like that. So yeah, 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 right. So do you, you find, but that's like, 
I know lately I've been finding that, you know, for guys who, if you're weekend warriors or guys, you know, if you're not backpacking into the, heading into the back country for a five day hunt, you're going to have a lot of success just driving down those roads and looking for you. Like you said, decommissioned roads, walk down there, look for, cause the bears, I find those bears are lazy, right? Like they like to utilize those roads cause it's way easier to walk down a path, feed on the, on all the vegetation and easy stuff along that path or that old road than it is hiking up and down and over and through all the trees and everything. Well, and, you know, bears are all about calories, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're going to be burning a lot more calories and therefore lessening your chance of survival if you're going up and down and up and down. Yeah. But if there's a nice easy path that you can take and still gain calories and retain those calories, to me, you know, that's that's just smart living on their part. And if you can exploit that as a person, yeah. that's even better. And, I, you know, I, I don't want people just to road hunt. That's not what I'm getting at. You you learn so much more when you park and you get out and walk. Yeah. Even even just learning the terrain, be like, oh, you know, I went around this corner and it was logged this year. But, you know, in three or four years, this is going to be a good spot to hunt. So that's just good material for the back of your head. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the thing about road hunting is like road hunting, you hear success stories. And like my dad, and my uncles, they're prime examples of road hunting. Road hunting, like the sun's going to shine on, on a road hunter's ass every once in a while. You're going to get lucky. Like you're going to drive down a clear cut and then you're going to see a big, boar or a big elk standing right there and you're going to shoot it but it doesn't happen every single year if you get out you start to learn the terrain you start to look for the sun you start to learn what to look for and uh in this instance bears what you know what bears like at certain times of the year and the habitat and all that stuff they're going to like it the same it's going to be the same every year right you're going to learn that stuff and you're going to be more successful in the long run if if you do get out and you walk around and you investigate and you learn you learn the animal or the species that you're trying to you're trying to kill my my brothers actually they have a nickname for me they actually call me the road warrior and the, <laughs> because they like to give me a hard time about road yeah. hunting although you know i i don't do it but i i i don't do it a ton i should say i don't rely on it but i definitely use roads to my uh-huh. favor yeah so yeah. yeah well and especially when you're bear hunting too i mean like i mean the more ground you cover the better your chances are and like especially up here in british columbia there's a lot of bears but um you use those like i find anyway like you utilize those those road systems and like the grasses if you get into the real thick shit you're not going to find that green that really nice green grass because there's not enough sun getting through there yet and sometimes a lot of the snow hasn't even melted in a lot of those areas but when you get to the areas where you know they have been logged and or decommissioned roads and there's you know there's less trees more sun's getting in there you get more water running down the hillside that grass is going to be high it's going to be higher it's going to be greener bears are going to be focusing on that more than they are you know in the thick timber because there's just not going to be as much foliage in there for them especially in the very you know in the very early season where they need that they would just come on hibernating and they need all that they need those calories like you said like it's they need them like they got to rebuild of you know, six months of sleeping. So well, I, I completely agree. Um, there, it's yeah. You just got to find those open spots and that fresh green shoots. That's what you're looking for. First mm-hmm. off. Yeah. Dandelions too. If you can find a nice dandelion place for those dandelions, man. And uh, last year, I, I have never seen this before. Uh, but last year I, I caught a bear digging up daisies and he was eating the roots. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. He wasn't eating the flowers. He there was a spot, there was a grassy patch in the road. I caught him standing there, and he saw me and stood up, and he just kind of walked off. But I went there, and yeah, he was just digging up those roots, and I don't know why, um, but I had never seen that before. So yeah, that's I don't know, that's a tip. Yeah, they're funny. They're like I came across this underneath this power line. These power lines. I was walking underneath the power lines, and you know how they're all cleared, and they keep them cleared because there's a road. There's a road underneath the power lines. And they like to keep that area clean and like the dandelions and like the tall grass is great underneath those because it's all open, right? That's, that's the only area in those places that's open and came across this area and it had high grass and dandelions and there was a nice, there was a bear in there just rolling around like, like he was on cloud, like just having a, <laughs> a sponge bath, just rolling around and eating the berries and like just laying there loving life. So I let him have it for a little bit, but he ended up coming home with me, so. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Let him have his moment. You're yeah, so I did. Funny. I did. I gave it to him. I, I let him sit there for a bit and bask in it and said, okay, buddy, keep enjoy this. So it ain't gonna last for very much longer. But Matt, I think one of the biggest things I, I got out of your 
but I mean, there's so much in your book, but um, even the, the, the branches when they're breaking them over their shoulders and stuff like that. When I was out moose hunting with my wife last fall, um, it was a totally new area. And I was like, well, we're in a new area here. I'm going to look for elk. I'm going to look for bear. I'm going to look, you know, for all those signs. And man, I couldn't believe how much bear sign I was seeing old, new, and everything you're talking about, the the branches all over the place, uh, over the shoulder being busted off. And then I started paying attention to where a lot of those were in, in my area. I'm not saying it's everywhere, um, but I really started no- noticing a lot of it were a couple of old roads joining together. Uh, you know, like within 50 yards of that and there'd be broken branches freaking everywhere. And then you'd look into the trees a little farther into the, you know, those couple of year old trees or whatever, and you'd see them stripped off and it's like, holy shit balls. This is what he's talking about. And yeah, it's like what, over and over and over. And, and you know, that's kind of why I wrote this. Like once you start to know what to look for, Nature has a story. To, I've said this before. Nature has a story to tell you if you'll just slow down and listen um, and just pay attention because there's, you know, lots of times you, especially starting out, you just don't know what to look for. But once you do, boy, there's there's a lot out there to to notice and take note of. And it certainly helps um, your ability to hunt the creature that you're after if you know what to look for. And that's that's what I was trying to do with that book. So I'm glad you I'm glad that's what you got out of it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it'll just continue on too. Cause now it's, it's not only looking for that, but it's like, if I go to another area now, am I going to find those broken branches or, you know, all that, those similar spots, are they going to be in a, in a similar situation? Like the amount that I found, you know, with those old roads joining together that not driven roads, just like you say, old logging roads that you just walk. And so that'll be what I'm paying t- attention to this year is to see if there's any similarities to what I found last year and trying to put together a puzzle. So when I'm looking at uh, Onyx or iHunter or whatever it is, and it's like, oh, okay, there's some old cuts in here. So there's got to be some old roads that go, you know, zigzag back and forth because I know you can't drive up there anymore and try to go find those areas and see if there's any easy pathways or anything like that. And, you know, kind of target them from that perspective, knowing what, I'm hoping should be there with, with the surrounding what I'm seeing on the computer and stuff like that. One one thing, one thing that I found um, really handy for calling is now when it starts to get warm and this is um, this wasn't last year's so much because it wasn't nearly as hot as it was the year before, but in June afternoon hunting, I found to be the most successful was um, mid around midday when it was its hottest believe it or not now what i was doing was i was go i i was using uh i was just using an online like on x maps for instance now that they're in canada we can use them um using on on x maps looking finding areas where i knew there was going to be water and deep deep trevises like a, a canyon with water at the bottom and if you walk down into those areas you're going to notice it's about 10 to 15 degrees cooler down in these areas. And it's green, like it's right green right now. Everything up top is already starting to dry out because of th- this particular year we had a really dry, we, it was one of our drought years. We had bad forest fires, all that stuff, but down, down in these little gullies and stuff way down low, there was lots of foliage water. It was so cool down there. I couldn't believe it. Like it was almost like it, like I swear to God, 10 to 15 degrees cooler. I get down there. I see nothing but fresh bear sign, nothing but fresh bear sign. So instead I, I took what I could walk back up to the top and I waited. And then I started calling, started calling, believe it or not, two bears popped up within 15 minutes. That must've been down there when I was out cruising around. But like, as soon as I started seeing the bear sign and the stuff I needed to take away and understand that there is bears either have been there or they're going to be back in there or they're there right now in the general area. I moved back up. I started calling and sure enough, two bears popped up right away. Started walking back up a little bit, you know, coming to the, coming to the noise. But you know, that, that was another great tool. Um, I found just like, if it's really hot and in the late, that was in the later season. And now obviously the rut was going on. So I imagine, you know, they're probably doing their rut activity when it's a little cooler. Cause they're not going to be up cruising. They, 
to get uh, once you got out of these little gullies where where the river was and it was nice way down in these low areas where you know you get a bit of breeze and stuff once you get out of there it was hot hot again so um you know i, I assume that they're doing most of their breeding and stuff at night or you know during the later later uh hours of the day or early early in the morning and so you can you can take away a couple of things from that story is like it was cool for you and yeah. temperature wise and you kind of wanted to be down there because it was it was it felt better yeah and that feels for those bears that you know they're rubbing trying to get that that late fall hide that they had on how uh -huh. much that is for them and then you used the sound to bring the bears to you instead of going through that area and possibly bumping those bears or getting this you know having them smell you or something like that you backed out and called that mm -hmm. pulled down into them and then they came to you that's an example of using the sound to do the work for you or doing the walking for you so you don't just bust through there and, and kick the bears out they were probably undisturbed they thought something was dying they went to go get it and there you go so i mean yeah that's that's a great story a great example yeah and unfortunately they weren't they weren't quite what i was looking for but i mean still you know it was i ended up getting a bear out of a the drainage a couple drainages over but um that's one thing if we get a, you know you get another hot spring that's one thing to look for with you know to add to your calling sequences you know you, if you're going you don't have to necessarily if you got a day off of work you can go like go to go on go to onyx look for those areas on online right try to you know do a little bit of um e-scouting find areas like that look at the weather and if it's going to be hot Man, that's just another tool to have in your arsenal when you're looking for bears. Because, man, that worked really well. And, and like I said, I, when I went down there, it was literally like I was up top. I was sweating. It was so hot. And when I went down there, it was cool. Like, you know, when you get like, it's like walking inside. Of, it was like walking inside a house that had, was the air conditioning was blasting all day. And you've been out shoveling in the, in the you know, backyard. Like, that's how much cooler it felt. And like, so no, once I got down there, I, I was like, well, no wonder they're down there, right? Like, no wonder there's bears down here because it's so much cooler. Every, they got everything they need. They got water. They got cool. They, they, I mean, it's cool down there. They got food, everything they need. The only thing that they don't have is like, they're just not, they were not breeding around. It was pretty steep, right? Like it was really steep, tough terrain, obviously, because to get that, you know, for those, those creeks to get down there and for it to be that cool, you have to, you have to get a lot of elevation quickly. But uh, like I said, man, they were, they were in there somewhere just hanging out for the day, right? Waiting for the, w waiting for the weather to cool down and probably, you know, right before dark or right at dark, they were getting up and sniffing around, looking for sows and stuff like that. But man, it sure worked good. Um, and then last year, it just wasn't as hot. I, you know, I tried it a few times, but it was still like, we had a really rainy, wet June. Like I think it, we had record rains for June. So it, it, I just didn't find it effective. It had, it was only working on those, on the years. It was really, really hot, which was a, a few years ago. So it all depends, mm -hmm. but it's just something, something guys can use as well. Sounds like a money spot when the, when the time is hot, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the thing is like, cause like you, I mean, I always thought, well, if it's too hot, um, the bears are going to be, you know, it's going to be really hard to find to locate bears and, um, you know, uh, but I mean, if it's just, like I said, it's just something else you can, you can think of if you're still looking to cut your bear tag and, you know, the weather's turning really hot and, um, it's just, it's one other area you can look if, uh, if it's situation, like I was actually hoping last year was actually hoping it was going to get hot just because like, I, it was like a like it was almost like a given like that one year was working so well it was like every drainage i went to i was pulling bears up out of those drainages look and i like i had already had one bear tag and i was looking for a really nice i wanted a really nice big color phase bear um you know i found a couple a couple of nice color phase bears but they're a little smaller um some you know a decent sized um dark black bear but i had already already got one so um you know it just wasn't what i was looking for so i kind of um I, I didn't pull the trigger on anything, but, uh, yeah. Um, it's just, like I said, it's just another tool for, for guys to use. Doug, if you, if you were in an area where let's say there wasn't any, like exactly what Kevin's talking about, any like steep drainages, anything like that, it was kind of more gradual and stuff. If it was a hot season, would you be looking for, you know, maybe cut blocks or whatever that are more like North facing and stuff. So they're not getting scorched all day long or. What what would yeah. you focus on there if you if you couldn't find the steep crevices to to go down into? I'd still, I mean, there's going to be a water somewhere, so I'd be I'd be looking for those creek bottoms and stuff. 
Um, but yeah, I, I would be looking for shaded areas, uh, north sides and slopes. Um, you know, maybe uh, mature timber with uh, uh, maybe a cut next to it because they might be bed down in the mature timber. So I would try to call into that timber to bring them out. Um, but yeah, you want to find shaded areas, cooler areas, uh, other than what is available in the direct sunlight for sure. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Pete. Um, yeah. Cause there is, cause you know, there is times, definitely the times when all of a sudden it does get too hot and like, you got to think like, man, um, you know, there's been sun on this one, like some hillsides you get, especially like right out, right on early when the snow melts, man, they sure glisten with green. They're just popping everywhere, but it doesn't take very long, like, especially down here in the Southern end of the province where you get those, you know, it could be Maine. We're getting the 30 degree plus temperatures. It doesn't take very long for all that that stuff to get eat, not eaten up but all of a sudden to turn brown and then you know on the other side where it's you know they're not getting it they're getting a little bit of sun in the morning and a little bit in the evening but man they you know they start to green up nicely by then so that's uh that's a good point you you know later on you definitely want to be looking moving around looking a little bit more not worried so much about the about the south facing slopes yeah and you know the the the, the later in the spring it gets the more and more the the food the brush and everything else the more and more things grow in yeah. and so yeah. like in early spring food is concentrated bears are going to be concentrated and as that growth expands the bears expand yeah. um and it's it's the same thing in late fall in in late fall the food is more con because there's not much left but before that it was more spread out so it's just it's yeah. kind of this ebb and flow the spring is very early spring and late fall very similar in, in how you hunt yeah right yeah and then throughout the year kind of they're kind of i mean like they're they have to eat and they eat a lot like um um yeah they eat tons so you gotta you definitely if it's early on you definitely the spots you're looking for you can definitely narrow it down a lot easier than and i find too like if it's later and the snow is melted you they tend to be in denser areas as well like they're not they're not just focusing, like you said, Doug, in those areas where it is really green or like those areas where there's no snow. They're like, all the snow is gone now. And so like areas, like I said before, where um, no sun's getting into them, the, those thick trees. So the grass isn't growing. But now, you know, there's more, there's, it's drier, there's more sun, there's less snow. Areas that are getting a little bit more shade tend to be a little greener later on than they, they were early on in the spring anyways. And, and, and again, that's, that's a good point of, I know we're talking about spring, but it's also a good thing to keep in mind about fall hunting too. Like uh -huh. there are going to be areas that, uh, berries ripen first, and then there's going to be areas where they ripen much later. And it could be the same, same, um, species of berry, but it's, you know, 200 yards down the road. It's, it's, uh, not getting as much sun, but it's still going to get sun and it's going to ripen, you know, two weeks later. So keep that in mind too. Like you just got to learn the pattern of the food throughout the year that you're hunting. Um, that's, that's a big part of bear hunting is just learning the pattern of the food for the time of year that you're hunting, yeah. whether it's grass or berries or whatever it is. Uh -huh. You ever been, uh, you ever been hunting bears calling and you had, have you ever had a close call? Like what's the close, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you have. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, well, let's see. Close call. Uh, I had a bobcat at the end of my gun. Stop yeah, we talked about that. We talked huh? about that last time. Not last time you were on the show. Last time you were on the show, we were, it was early. And uh, we were just talking about e-scouting. Um, but I think last year you, you you talked about that. The one, And you actually shared a video with us. That, that fucking cat. <laughs> He's like going to... I thought he was going to blow on the end of your rifle there. Do you remember? Oh, you, yeah. You've seen that, right, Pete? Yeah, it was... I never seen anything like that before. That was yeah. crazy. And he, yeah, he almost jumped in my lap. I mean, that's that's as close as it gets without something happening. Um, bear wise, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I I talk a little bit about this in the book. Um, I was predator calling up up around Mount Baker. Uh, it, this was like the last couple of days of season, and there was like a foot and a half of snow on the ground, but it was ice crystal clear cold morning you know one of those mornings where you're walking and it's not snowing 
but any sort of water vapor is frozen. So the whole, like the air is just glistening with ice shards. Yeah. Uh, my brother and I hike in, I set him, Oh, 50 yards or so to my right. And I'm calling down into this, uh, Creek bottom with what I called, uh, uh, their apartments. There's little clusters of trees on the opposite side of the Canyon. And it, you can see like, it looked like bear tracks going into those, a couple of those things, the trees, but they weren't coming out. It, I, I wondered if they were den areas. I never crossed the creek to find out because it was nasty. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nasty trying to get up there. I was like, I'll, I'll call and try to get them to come to me. Behind me was a hill that went up and then a tree line. And so I sit down and I start calling and I call in. It's freezing cold. And I think I stopped at like a half an hour. And I just wanted to get up to uh, uh, kind of stretch a little bit because I was so cold. Um, I get up to stretch, sit back down, start calling some more. And then I hear a shot like, I don't know, I think it was like 10, 15 minutes later. And it was my brother. And I said, uh, you know, hey, what'd you get? And he goes, oh, it's a bear. Stay there. It's not down yet. And then we pause for a few minutes. And he goes, okay, it's down. Anyway, I go to talk to my brother. And this is a good example of. It helps to have a second person with you when you call because it's an extra set of eyes and they see different angles that you don't. When I stopped calling the first time, I had a bear about 10 yards behind me. Um, and all I had was brush to my back. But the bear was behind me and I couldn't see it just because of the way the terrain was. And my brother thought I was done calling. So my brother stood up and was going to start walking to me. And when he did, that bear caught his movement and then started walking up the hill away from me. And my brother was flustered and never got a shot. Of course, he wouldn't like shoot at me or, you yeah. know, near me type of thing. But he was kind of disappointed. And so then he sits back down when I start calling again. And then another bear from the same tree line come barreling down the hill. And that's the one he ended up shooting. Neither of those bears I saw. Um, and But that one was just, you know, yards behind me. And I had no idea. And there's there's been a handful of times at least that I know of that things have come right on the other side of the stump and I can hear them. Um, but I can't see them. And then uh, they'll smell something or, or hear something they don't like and they'll, they'll run off. But I've, I've had bears on the other side of the stump. I want to say I've had at least a couple cougars right on the other side of my stumps. Um, just by the way they leave, you know, cause bears are kind of noisy most of the time. If they are, if they're boning out, they can be noisy. They can be deadly quiet too, but yeah. Most of the time, we're off and running. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Last year, so I'm I'm set up. I got I I found a good couple trees, and I I set up into an area, and like I was I I walked in off the road. There's an old logging road, and I seen this little clear cut down, like a little hilly side that was open had an opening. Great spot to shoot is facing downhill. I knew there was a creek way down there, so I cut off the road and I I go to the top of that little clearing. There's three trees set up at the top and I just snuggle into those trees and I hang my bow up beside me. I had an arrow knocked on my bow, had it sitting there and I start calling, I'm calling and calling. Nothing's coming up. Nothing's coming up. I'm just sitting there real quietly calling, calling. And then after about, oh man, it must've been after about 40 minutes, I hear a snap of a twig. I turn around and there's a black bear standing on two feet with his nose in the air 10 yards from me <laughs> and i was like holy shit so i grab quickly grab my bow turn around and like try to get my uh you know get not get my um my release knocked on it's on the d loop and just my move my quick movement and turning around he freaking wanted nothing to do with it he took off like a like he was shot at a cannon he was loud as hell barreling out of there but man he got my heart going pretty good when i turned around i was like oh <laughs> shit that's a, yeah uh bad setup bad setup <laughs> but uh, i remember I mean, that it was text great... coming in and i was just like what <laughs> yeah I, man i was like i i would had to check my shorts after i was like holy fuck that was close i'm like if he didn't break that twig he would have came he could have came up and licked me like man and this is like i've seen grizzlies in this area too right like but man, I was like, fuck, that was close. I had a hard my heart going and I was like, whew. And that's what I love about bear hunting or predator calling. I mean, that that cougar a couple of weeks ago, that's that, that was a close call in my opinion. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. 
Let's hear. I, I, let's hear about that. I, I think you know. I, I Pete, do you have anything else about beers? Because I want to talk a little bit. about I want to hear this Cougar story. No, then, I, I, um, I think pretty much everything was answered for what I had to my my questions for this year and yeah, everything. Cool, cool. Yeah, let's hear about that Cougar dude because that was uh, that was awesome. Um. Okay. So a couple of weeks ago, I, I went out. I wanted to check my trail camera. I've had it out there for like four months, right, along this creek bottom that I bear hunt, and. Uh, on the way in, I thought, well, I'm going to check, I'm going to check a couple of spots. I, uh, th- this one place I call Paradise, where I shot a bear in 2009. It's, it's surrounded by super thick brush, little patches of green. I go, well, on my way out or on my way in, I'm going to set one more camera in this area and then cut through the brush and go check my camera. Anyway, I sit down and uh, go through the brush. I, I get in there and uh, th- the area I'm looking at is like maybe 30 yards wide by 50 yards long. It's not big at all. And it's all thick, nasty brush blowdowns all around it. And uh, I put my speaker up on a stump and kind of hide it underneath a tree that it's growing out of it. And then I tuck myself against the stump that had another tree that was growing out. So I was kind of in the shade, tucked in. And uh, I hit play and I'm playing calf distress and then uh, a lonely calf call for my ultimate predator calls app that I have. Anyway, I'm calling for the, uh, about 55 minutes. And I thought, well, I, I, I'm still got, you know, another half hour hike to go check this camera. It's time to get going. So, um, I had on a, uh, what I call the, the predator poncho. It's basically a burlap poncho that I've made that kind of covers my whole body. So when I sit down, it covers my legs and everything, you know? Yeah, it so looks I, like a ghillie suit kind of. It's got all the yeah, leafy stuff on it, yeah. Almost like a ghillie suit, but more yeah. of a kind of long poncho. Anyway, yeah, I'd been sitting for so long, kind of Indian style. I was kind of stiff, and so I, I put my gun to my right. And the, the stump I'm sitting on is kind of almost like shaped like a fist to where if you're sitting on the knuckles, you can't see around your knuckles necessarily to your right, but you, you can definitely see to your left. Um, and so I, I stood up. And I went to grab my gun and I just kind of glanced over to my left and it was 13 steps. There was this cat, the, the cougar was sitting there just looking at my call. And when he saw me move, he just kind of looked at me and I was like, holy shit. And, but I didn't, <laughs> oh, but I, I, I didn't make, I, I, if you're a hunter, you hunt long enough. It's like, even with deer, if, you, if you're looking at a deer and you make eye contact, like they know something's up. Yeah. But if you glance over and you don't make eye contact, you can get away with a little bit mm-hmm. because you don't know that you've seen them. And so that cougar was the same way. I just kind of glanced up. I'm like, oh, crap. I didn't even have my rifle. And I, I slowly just kind of go down to my rifle. I'm not super slow or nothing, but I was just pretending that, um, you know, like I didn't see him. Yeah. And I just raised up and he was looking at me and I was aiming at his head for just a split second. And I don't want to shoot him in the head because he, he was sitting on his on his butt yeah. and his his upper part was up. Um, cause I didn't want to ruin the skull. So I just kind of eased down a little bit, shot him right behind the shoulder. And he, he basically grimaced and kind of twisted just once and died right there on the spot. But I mean, that happened that quick. And so there's a couple things you can learn from that. One, I called for an hour, but I broke my rule. I didn't sit there and shut the thing off and wait for something to come in. Cougars mm-hmm. are famous, for, um, because they'll sit down and just watch and watch and watch. Uh, they're very, very patient, but once something shuts off, they might go in there and take a look. Um, and, and it's just a great example of like, man, things can happen quick, predator calling. And I went from a call to where I, or a set where I thought nothing was happening to killing a, a mature Tom Cougar, like 150 pound cat, 13 steps away. And it, it literally that's like one jump for him. He was seven foot six from nose to tail. And that's what the tail had a little bit of a, uh, brick and mortars in it. So I, I, I measured him when I got home. But I bet you he was probably about seven, eight, maybe seven, nine. He's yeah. a big cat. Oh yeah, it was it was amazing. I was I was very excited. I text my wife. I go cougar down, and she's like, "What? I didn't even know you were hunting." So she calls me. Oh, I barely have service. And, yeah. yeah. Well, you you sent me those pictures, and I was like, "What cougar?" Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, that was awesome, man. That was pretty cool. That, that was a nice cat for sure. Yeah, like you said yeah. though, man. Well, those cats, man, they're like they're eerie. They're so they're so methodical, like they're so quiet, they're so patient, and they're just like they they got their skills just honed down so well. Like, man, they just like 
they're just the perfect little predator those things like if you think about it i i thought he was five to seven years old the warden figures seven to eight but i'll find out soon with the tooth but either way that cat has killed easily a couple hundred deer easily yeah his life and during that set i thought i heard something maybe in front of me to my left just a little bit but i wasn't sure but i never saw anything but the the crazy thing is is all around me was they had they have thinned some of that area so there's trees that are just down there's brush everywhere like it i i know that they can do it but it's incredible to see how something that big can get through that stuff without making me aware of it yeah like breaking a branch you know something i didn't hear nothing when it came to that at all yeah man and even like the way like when it snowed like i was up there in december and i bumped those two cougars off that elk kill um and like man they just the way they move like they're just like you know it's the snow is deep and they were just like the snow is up past my knee and i'm hiking through this stuff i was chasing those trying to chase those cats down but man they're just flying on top of that stuff they're going up stuff through stuff and like yeah they're just they're just amazing animals those things like god they're yeah yeah super cool that was awesome buddy that was good and it was thick too when you're you're in there hunting too it was thick it's crazy like yeah 13 steps away that's that's, that's not very far yeah. no i i even went back the like a week after because i put up a trail camera on the on the bones because i wanted to see what was going to come in and all i had was like buzzards and stuff yeah but I, again, I, I went to where I shot and then I walked over to it. And I was like, holy crap, that was close. Like just reminding me that was it's one leap, you know, easy for that thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you'd be uh, you'd have a few uh, scratch. I don't know, like. I don't know what he weighed or nothing like, um, but I mean. You'd, I'm, you'd, I'm you'd, have, you'd have some scars on you for sure. Yeah, I'm guessing 150 pounds. I, I think yeah. I read a. They figure 60 stitches a second for a cougar attack. Yeah. Yeah. Holy. And I, is that and like I can, through your col- Like if you can get like all depends what you're wearing, I guess. Like I, yeah, it's tough. I, you hear stories and like, I, I remember I went hunting moose hunting with this guy once and he got, he got, uh, he was walking through and a cougar jumped on his back and bit into his backpack. He was chewing on his backpack and he was able to actually, he was a big dude and he actually grabbed the cat and was able to, he fought it off. He said it wasn't like once he grabbed, he, he was able to grab the cat literally and throw it off him. But um, his pack was pretty shredded. He didn't have any, he, he didn't have any major, major issues, maybe a couple little nicks here and there, but pretty cool story. But it's not like a, it's not like a big black bear, or like a grizzly that ended up on you, you know, where you literally, you you know, a cat's 150 pounds, you know, you're going to get scratched or you're going to get scarred. You, you know, you're, it's still light enough where you can, at least you can fight it off a bit, but um still yeah. pretty scary even even skinning that cat i had i i was very cognizant of how incredibly sharp those claws oh, were dude crazy sharp well, yeah because they you know they retract they're not like a bear that's out and it's getting dulled up those those things are like needles yeah man. Uh, just yeah I, I, it was it was an amazing experience and i'm still kind of in shock about it and uh, yeah i just i i'm very excited to pursue that more for sure yeah they're they're uh they're definitely fun to hunt man like i remember the first time first time i killed one i like just the first time you walk up to it man you're like what a what a crazy beautiful animal like just like total just ultimate predator just awesome yeah yep for sure yeah totally cool by the way i checked the trail camera and i had one deer on it and all the rest of the pictures were him really and for 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 four months yeah wow yeah, so he yeah. he'd been lurking around there, right? Yep. Yeah, it's crazy how they yeah they must there, there must have been something around there, maybe a kill or something that or for him to be around well, there, there that much. Like how there's scads of deer in there, but um the you know the last several years I've been hunting this kind of same 500 yard area, and just, I've got a ton of cougar on there. Not just him. Like last oh, year really? I had six different cougar. I think it was a uh, a female and a couple of uh, almost full grown i would say sub adult cats and then uh but you can just tell by the body size and stuff that different cats and uh, uh, numerous bears but yeah there's just a scat of predators in this work in this creek bottom but i'm sure you know he's he's 
I'm sure there's more deer because that's why he's hanging around. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, and he was a healthy cat. He wasn't starving for sure. He had a uh, no. deer stomach when I cut it open. And uh, so, yeah, he had, he had just ate. Yeah, that's cool. I, it's cool. I watched your video of you doing that. And that's one thing I've never thought to do with predators. But I think for the next one, I'm going to do it. I'm going to cut their stomach open just to see what they're eating. Like just especially oh, yeah. like a cat um, to see what it's been chewing, like what it's been feeding on for sure. Yeah, there was like hooves and stuff in there, wasn't there? You were yeah, there, yeah, there was hooves. The rest of it was like fur and then uh, like chunks of bone, like one inch chunks of bone. Because they'll they'll eat like they'll eat that bone. They have jaws yeah. strong French through that stuff. So, yeah, it's not it's nothing for them to chew up bones like that. Man, crazy. Swallowing those sharp. Like you think of how how sharp and jagged a bone is like a, like not a cook bone. You know what I mean? Like when, they, when you break it, how sharp it is. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. They can just digest that stuff. <laughs> it's insane. So are you going to do, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to get it full mounted? Y- yeah. So I'm, I'm going to do a full mount on it. Um, and I haven't figured out the, the pose I want yet, but I think I kind of want like a growl, you know, nasty uh-huh. looking face. My wife's like, no, I want it more of like it's walking with its mouth kind of open, but We'll compromise. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But yeah, 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 no doubt. There's so many good poses down there, and like I got mine. So he's just kind of like, so when you walk in the entrance, he's actually looking above. So when you walk in, he's just perched up on top, and you he's looking down at you when you when you walk in the house. If you turn your head around, he'd be sitting there looking at you. So oh, yeah, I, awesome. I, Freak I'm gonna have people out. a wall mount. So he yeah, he'll be able to go up on a wall or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And there's of course, so my... many cool mounts though like you look at mounts and like it's so hard to choose when you're doing a full mount for a cat it's like man there's so many cool ones yeah and, and of course my wife's like oh you know this is the only one you're gonna get so you should do a full mount and i laughed i said well i got news for you this isn't the only one I'm, i'll be getting I'm, this is my new... <laughs> you got the bug yeah it's but yeah and like man like i've never i i bumped those two this year off that um off that elk kill that i found and like I've seen them and like I've hunted them with dogs and but man I've never been able I've never had any success calling one in so that's pretty awesome that you're able to do that. I I'm, I'm uh about 25,000 words deep into a book about calling them in just so far. Yeah. I want to get at it, you know, and and good at it. Um but yeah, that's something I'm working on. Um Yeah, that's to, awesome. To help that's, people out. That's one thing I've never run into out here is uh is people trying to hunt cats just with calling like it's either dogs or nothing yeah and there isn't even a lot of that up here anymore i mean we got tons of cougars but yeah, yeah you just yeah you the houndsmen are kind of it's tough man like I, my buddy and i that that year i got that cougar like he was just getting into um running hounds and like he after that one year he quit he's like fuck man it's just too much work he was out he was like um it's too much work for me i don't i, I don't want anything to do with it so yeah. Uh, but it is a lot of work yeah you really got to dedicate to and those houndsmen do such a good job with those those oh, dogs yeah. are a lot of work yep. yep cool buddy well thanks for coming on the show again yeah man thanks for having me i appreciate it it's always uh always good to talk to my canadian friends oh, yeah, yeah no doubt man um i'll put your i'll put all the stuff up to your book uh unfortunately we're gonna have to i guess we we talked last time about doing an audio book how's that any any <laughs> forward movement <laughs> i got a hold of, i got a hold of samuel l jackson he he, he turned me down so i oh uh, no dude if you're gonna do it you should do it i think you should like man I, dude That'd i've been great. hitting the audiobooks hard like i was always against and i think i, I don't know if i talked to talked to this about or talked to you about this doug but i always felt like if i listened to the audiobook i wasn't doing the author justice because like he went through all this work to write it that I that I owed it to him or to her to read, like take the time and actually read it. But then you never get to the book. And like, I have so many books sitting on my bookshelf that I just haven't had time to get to. Cause like any reading lately I do is like for my kids to help my kids stuff out. And like, fuck, I could barely make it through one of those books. Yeah. Well, the, the problem with my book is I have a lot of pictures in there. Uh-huh. For, well, not a lot, but I have, you know, examples of bear peels and scat and stuff like that. So, yeah, I personally, I think it's better if someone actually reads it so they can see the photos. But yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd have to look into it. I don't know why I couldn't just 
audio recorded. I just have to get the clearance from my publisher, basically, I think. Yeah, because they're great. I, f- I feel like, and it's funny, like, everybody I talk to, they're like, yeah, I, I love audiobooks. I'm like, yeah. yeah. Love Especially it. when you got your drive to work in the morning, too, or, you know, on your way home or whatever. And it's like, however much time you get, even if you got half an hour, be like, well, I'm going to read, listen to part of it now, and tomorrow I'm going to finish yeah. off this part. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah totally and they just play, it. like, the one book I just finished on audiobook was um, Where Men Win Glory. It was a, It's about Pat Tillman. Ooh. familiar with him like he's the guy he played in the nfl and then he went yep. to war and he he got shot by <laughs> some other he got shot by other americans some other american that he knew ended up shooting him because they mistaked him for an afghani and like fuck he got shot by his buddy like brutal hey. yeah horrible freaking horrible yeah. but apparently like they go through the book they talk about a lot of that in that book about how many how much that's actually happens and man it's it probably happens a lot more than they'd like to like to say or like to admit. But man, I mean, yeah. I've never been to war, so I'm not going to start making judgment about anything. When somebody's shooting at you, or like not necessarily shooting at you, but the threat of being shot out, man. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. I've never been to war either, but uh, yeah, I, I I like to think I could imagine, but I probably can't imagine. Yeah, can't pretty imagine. gnarly. Yeah, but those uh, those audio books are killer. I think yours would be killer too. And I think like there's other books too that like they have a lot of pictures. Um, so I don't think I don't think it matters. Like you just skip through that part. Um, you just you just describe or maybe you describe it more. I don't know, but I think your yeah. book would be really good on audio audio book. Well, I appreciate it. I'll uh, if anyone's interested and they want to hire me per hour, I'll read the book to them uh, every night. And- <laughs> <laughs> maybe that. Maybe we should do <laughs> next year. I think what we'll do is we'll just do a whole our spring bear, bear series. We'll just oh. be you. Oh. Pete and I will sit here with a couple beer or something, or maybe some whiskey, and you can yeah. just open up the book and we'll do like chapter one. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just have and you then read. we'll make the beer, we'll crack a beer on each chapter. As yeah. Well, starts. and then so every <laughs> chapter will be a new episode, and we'll just every, every time we'll just start. <laughs> here we go. Introduction. They walk mainly on sea. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that'd be good. Okay, buddy. Thanks for coming on. Pete, you got anything yeah, else? Man. Nope. Nope. Thanks. Always take away a little bit here and there. And yeah, try to put together the puzzle and appreciate it. So uh, people Thanks, read, the bu- read the book. Uh, if you can't buy it, try to scrounge it off somebody because there's so much info in there. It's great. Yeah. I'd tell you where to buy it, but I have no idea. Because they're all sold out. Because that's just how good they are. I mean, yep. Ebook, you e-book. can get it on. There e-book. you go. Oh, okay. Get the e-book. e-book. Yeah. Get the yeah. e-book, everybody. Yeah. Okay, man. Talk to you later, guys. Thanks. Okay, Thanks again, everyone, for tuning into the Focus Hunting Podcast. Coming at you as part of the Waypoint Outdoor Collective. I want to take a quick sec and make a huge shout out and say thanks to the sponsors of this show, uh, starting with BC's premier archery shop, Hardcore Archery, located right here in Kelowna, British Columbia. Um, AKU Boots, they've uh, they've been supporting the show for a while now. Uh, both Pete and I, we've been running these boots for well over a year. You know, hunting in BC, we face probably the harshest backcountry environment in the world. We got deserts, Rocky Mountain, extreme coastlines, you name it. Uh, and these are the only boots that have lasted me more than one hunting season. So, you know, they're definitely worth the investment. You owe it to your feet to uh, use AKU Boots. Uh, use promo code FOCUS and get 15% off right. Uh, they're probably going to cringe because I always pronounce the name wrong, but uh, it is what it is. Onyx Maps now available in Canada. Stay tuned, guys. We've partnered up with Onyx, and we're going to be getting you guys some more information on Onyx and their mapping system for Canada. Uh, for those of you in the U.S., you've already got access to it and most likely been using the app. Pete and I got early access to this app, and to be honest, it rocks. Um, but like I said, we're going to get you more information on that, and we're going to be able to get you guys a little bit of discount. Um, So lastly, if you guys could please leave a rating and review on whatever platform you're listening. We really appreciate the support. Love you guys. Until next time. Thanks.